Hey everybody, thanks for joining us again today for our chapter book story time here in Caribou, Maine. I'm Miss Erin and we're in the Caribou Public Library today, continuing to read Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is the abridged version and we are on chapter 13 today. Um, they had just had a day of battle. Oh, Jim and his comrades and the doctor and the captain. Um, and they have discovered that they have four men against the pirates, nine left. So we will see what happens today. My Sea Adventure. The captain's shoulder blade and calf had been badly wounded. He would recover, the doctor said, but for weeks he must not walk or move his arm. After our meal, the squire and the doctor sat by the captain's side for a talk. Then the doctor grabbed his hat and pistols, strapped on a cutlass, and put the map in his pocket. With a musket over his shoulder, he climbed the fence and set off through the trees. I knew that he also carried some cheese and was headed to see old Ben Gunn. The sun was fiercely hot. I longed for the cool shadow of the woods, away from all this blood and death. I needed to escape this place. I decided to go find a large white rock where, Gu where Ben Gunn had hidden a boat. I would slip out when no one was watching, which I knew was wrong, but I was only a boy and I had made my mind up. I filled my pockets with biscuits and grabbed two pistols, a powder horn and bullets. When the coast was clear, I made a bolt for it over the fence and into the thickest of trees. I ran down to the cove and looked out through the trees. I could see the Hispaniola still flying the Jolly Roger. I crept out to the sandy area and crawled as quickly as I could toward the white rock. I reached it before the sun went down. Right below the rock, I found a low place covered with high brush. Here I saw a little tent of goatskins. I lifted the side of the tent and there was Ben Gunn's boat, a homemade lopsided round boat made of wood and goatskin. It was very small, even for me. Until then, I had never seen a coracle, this type of round boat made by primitive people. But I can say that Ben Gunn's boat was the worst coracle ever made by man. <laughs> Here's a picture of him finding the boat. Hmm. Yet the strange little boat gave me my next wild idea. I would slip out at night, cut the Hispaniola loose from her anchor, and let her drift ashore. Down I sat to wait for darkness and eat some biscuits. When night came, I waded into the water with my coracle and set myself to sea. The coracle was impossible to steer. No matter how hard I tried, I could not get her to go straight. Turning around and round was what she did best. Even when I paddled, she turned in every direction but the one I aimed for. Luckily, the tide pulled me toward the Hispaniola. I came alongside of her anchor and laid hold of the rope. I sliced at the rope with my knife until I had cut the last fibers. Curiosity then grabbed hold of me and I grabbed hold of the rope. I pulled myself up hand over hand until I could see the cabin. There was Israel Hands wrestling with the man in the red nightcap. Each had a hand upon the other's throat. I dropped back down, frightened by the scene. I could see the glow of the pirate's campfire on shore and hear them singing the song that I knew well. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho in ho, a bottle of rum. Suddenly, my little coracle tipped in the water and pushed me toward the hull of the Hispaniola. I lay down flat in the bottom of that awful little boat, prayed, and got ready to meet my maker. Oh dear, here he is looking in the window. <laughs> and holding on to the rope. I must have lain like that for hours, waiting for death. I could feel the coracle being beaten by waves, and I was drenched with sea spray. Sea, uh, sleep fell upon me, and I dreamed of home. I woke to find that I had drifted out of the cove. My throat was dry. All around me was salty water that I could not drink. The, sea, the sun beat down on me, and my brain ached. The spray of seawater caked my lips with salt. I bailed water out with my sea cap and dreaded drifting out to the open sea. Mm, here he is trying to bail the water with his cap out of his little boat. Then I saw, not half a mile away, the Hispaniola. I knew I would be spotted, but I was so thirsty that I was glad of this. I wondered how the ship could have drifted so far. The men on board must be dead or drunk, I thought. 
or maybe they had deserted the ship. Perhaps if I could get on board, I could steer the ship and return her to her captain. I drifted closer to the ship. What if there were still men on board? And how tall she looked to me from down in my coracle. But I laid aside my fears and waited for my chance. A large swell lifted my boat. I sprang to my feet and leapt, which pushed my coracle underwater. I caught the jib boom and clung there, panting. I had now lost the coracle and was left with no way off the Hispaniola. I tumbled headfirst upon the deck. All along the side of the deck, I saw empty bottles. And then, sure enough, I saw two drunk or maybe dead pirates. Redcap was as stiff as a handspike, and Israel Hands was propped against his side, his chin on his chest, his face as white as a wax candle. The ship was being jostled about by the waves and the wind that caught her sails. At every jump of the ship, the men swayed back and forth, but gave no sign of life. I saw splashes of blood on the deck and was sure that they had killed each other. But then, while I was looking and wondering, Israel Hands turned partly round. With a low moan, he sat up. I knew he must be in great pain, and at first I felt sorry for him. But when I remembered the talk that I had overheard from the apple barrel, all pity left me. Come aboard, Mr. Hands, I said with a slow, sly smile. Hmm. All right, chapter 14 is called Israel Hands. Hands rolled his eyes around and stared at me. Much hurt, I asked him. He grunted. I don't have no luck, and that's what's the matter with me. He nodded toward the man with the red cap. As for that swab, he's good and dead, he is. O'Brien weren't no sailor anyhow. And where might you have come from? Well, I said, I've come aboard to take this ship, Mr. Hands. You'll call me captain. He looked at me sourly, but said nothing. By the by, I said, pointing to the Jolly Roger. I can't have these colors, Mr. Hands. I'll strike them. Better none than these. So do you remember that the Jolly Roger is what they call the pirate flag? So he took down the pirate's flag. I ran to the flag lines, brought down their black flag, and chucked it overboard. God save the king, said I, waving my cap. He watched me keenly and slyly. I reckon, Captain Hawkins, he said, you'll want to get ashore now. Suppose we talks. Why, with all my heart, Mr. Hands, say on. Now, look here. You gives me food and drink and an old handkerchief to tie my wound up, and I'll tell you how to sail her. I'm not going back to the cove, says I. We'll sail into North Inlet and beach her quietly there. North Inlet? Why, I'll help you sail her there, I will, he said. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes, I had the Hispaniola sailing easily along the western coast toward the North Inlet that I had seen on the map. Then I went below to my own cabin where I got a soft silk handkerchief of my mother's. I bound up hands, great bleeding stab wound in his thigh. <laughs> I drank some cool water and ate some biscuits. Both of us were feeling better. <laughs> Here's a picture of hands and his wound on his thigh that had to be bound up. The breeze served us well. Soon we had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was enjoying my role as captain. I had plenty of water and good things to eat. The weather was pleasant. The only thing that bothered me was Israel Hand's odd smile as he watched and watched and watched me at my work. We reached the North Inlet, but of course had no anchor to let down. In order to beach the ship, we'd have to wait for the tide to go out. So here's a picture of him steering and kind of in that same picture is a map of where the inlet is. The North Inlet. We both sat in silence over a meal. Then Hans said with his same strange smile, this here's an unlucky ship, this Hispaniola, Jim. I never seen such dirty luck, not I. There was this here O'Brien now. He's dead, ain't he? Do you take it as a dead man is good for good? Or that as a dead man is dead for good? Or do we come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hands, but not the spirit, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world and may be watching us. Ah, says he. Well, I do know one thing I do. Dead men don't bite. That's my view. Amen. So be it. Now, Jim, I'll take it kind if you step down into that there cabin and get me a bottle of wine. I knew he just wanted me to leave the deck. 
he wouldn't look me in the eye. All right, Mr. Hands, I answered, but I'll have to dig for it. I scuttled down the stairs and tried to make a lot of noise. Then I slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the next ladder, and popped my head out of the opening beyond him. He was on his hands and knees. I watched as he pulled himself across the deck and picked a bloody dirk, a 10 inch knife, out of a coil of rope. He hid it in his jacket and crawled back to his old place. So his real hands could move about and he was now armed with a dirk. I quietly crept back, slipped into my shoes and grabbed a bottle of wine. I came up the ladder and found hands just as I'd left him. Here's luck, he said, taking a swig of the wine. The tide's out now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail, slap in, and be done with it. I was a good sub-captain, and Hans was an excellent pilot. Starboard, if a little, so steady, he commanded. Starboard, barboard a little, steady, steady. We went about and about and dodged in near the shore. Now, my hearty luff, I pulled hard, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly and went straight for the sandy shore. With all the excitement, I forgot to watch hands. When I looked around, he was already halfway towards me with the dirk in his right hand. We both cried out when our eyes met. Mine was a shrill cry of terror, and his was a roar of fury like charging bull. He lunged forward and I leapt sideways. I drew a pistol from my belt, took a cool aim, and drew the trigger. But there was no flash. The powder was wet from the seawater. Why had I not cleaned and reloaded my only weapons? Although he was wounded, hands moved quickly. He grizz his grizzled hair tumbled over his red, furious face. I knew my pistols were useless, and I knew that I could be boxed in against the sides of the ship. If that happened, nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of life. I placed my palms against the main mast and waited, every nerve upon the stretch. Yikes. Here's a picture of him trying to not... <laughs> be stabbed with the dirk. Hands also paused. He moved to the right, I moved to the left. Right, left, back again. It was like two boys at playing dodging around the rocks back home at Black Hill Cove. But you may be sure no boy's heart had ever beat so wildly. I saw no hope of any escape. Suddenly, the Hispaniola struck the beach. The ship shook and leaned over on her side. Water splashed onto the deck and we were tossed in an instant and rolled almost together down the deck. The dead red caps tumbled, <laughs> tumbled stiffly after us and my head hit Israel Hand's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. I got to my feet, but Hands was tangled with the dead body and I could not run on the tilted deck. And Hands was coming at me with his dirk. Quick as I thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, climbed up hand over hand and did not draw a breath until I was seated on the cross trees. The dirk had struck the mast, not half a foot below me, and there stood Israel Hands with his mouth open and his face looking up at mine. Oof, here's a picture of him again. You see how he's up on this cross piece, and here is Hands with the knife in his mouth. Oh my goodness. Now that I had a moment to myself, I loaded my pistols, but Hands was also hauling himself into the shrouds. With the dirk in his teeth, he began slowly and painfully to climb. With a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. One more step, Mr. Hands, and I, I'll shoot. Dead men don't bite, you know. He stopped instantly. I could see by his face that he was trying to think, and this was a slow process for him. His expression made me laugh aloud. He took the dirk from his mouth and said, Jim, I don't have no luck, not I, but I reckon I'll have to strike. That comes hard, you see, for a master sailor to kill a good boy like you, Jim. I was smiling, listening to him and feeling cocky, when, in a flash, back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang. And there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, both my pistols went off and both dropped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, Israel Hands let go of the shrouds and plunged headfirst into the water. Oof. So we have Hands leaning back before he fell into the water. Both pistols right here shooting 
and he's pinned with the knife up here by his shoulder. <laughs> From my perch on the leaning cross trees, I could see him lying on the clean, bright sand as fishes swam over and around him. Mm. I felt sick, fainted, and ter I felt sick, faint, and terrified. Hot blood was running over my back and chest. The dirk that pinned my shoulder to the mast burned like a hot iron. I clung with both hands till my nails ached, and I shut my eyes until I could regain my senses. The thought of pulling the dirk from my shoulder made me shudder. Oddly enough, the knife only held me by a mere pinch of skin, and the shudder tore the skin loose. I ripped my shirt away from the knife and climbed down the shrouds to the deck. I went below to my cabin and tended to my wound. Then I cleared the deck of its last passenger, the dead man, O'Brien. With one good heave, I tumbled him overboard. I could see him and Israel lying side by side under the water and the quick fishes steering to and fro over them. Yikes. Oh my goodness. So next time we're going to read chapters 15 and 16. What could happen next? I hope you guys have a good weekend. We'll see you Monday. Bye.